Hey, Josh. Hello. Hey, Ron. How's it going? How's it going? Welcome to the LinkedIn Live and Unfiltered discussion with Josh Goldblum. Thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure to see you. Pleasure to have you on the Independent Lodging Congress channel. And uh, we've got about 30 minutes to have a bit of a conversation about how you see the world, which I know is pretty fascinating, actually. So I thought the best place to start would be tell us about you. And first question, are you related to Jeff Goldblum? Oh, um, <laughs> I think very distantly, actually. We, <laughs> okay. there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a core of Philadelphia Goldblums, and I think somewhere he's, he's in there, but I, I, I didn't see him on my 23 and Me, so I, I don't know. <laughs> but your worst is just in case. There's a I am. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> so t tell us about you for real, Josh. Um, so, you know, my background, um, best known for founding uh, Blue Cadet, which is an experience design agency based primarily in uh, Philadelphia, New York. Uh, there's about 45 of us. Uh, we work a lot in cultural organizations and brands, uh, basically weaving technology into physical environments. Um, so any sort of like location-based experience is like super, super interesting uh, to me. I'm actually now based out in LA, uh, Santa Monica more specifically, uh, but I've been working in sort of technology and public space for 20 years. I was in-house at Smithsonian as a new media specialist 20 years ago. Um, and, you know, like, honestly, my interests haven't really changed that much, which is like, how do you, uh, you know, Yes, Philly. Uh, you know how do how do you uh, how do you meaningfully uh, use technology in physical environments? You know, in ways that are not you know dystopian minority report a little bit more like utopian her. You know, like how do you get technology to serve you? Uh, you know, how do you have technology be you know useful, ubiquitous, um, but also kind of transparent? Um, and just like how do you create spaces that are just that serve humans well? Um, so. And, that, and then, you know, since we work with a lot of, you know, institutions that have a lot of content, so it's like, also, how do you like deliver really amazing content and experiences um, and a, con using contemporary tools? All right. So there's so much there to unpack that um, I'm tempted to try to parse that before I do, uh, in case any of the uh, people dialing in or watching this later uh, are interested in who I am. Uh, I'm Ron Swidler. I am uh, the Chief Innovation Officer at the Gettys Group Companies based in Chicago, and uh, we are a global design and development company in the hospitality space. I'm also the founder of the Hotel of Tomorrow Project, which is a global think tank on the future of hospitality, which is, I think, why they asked me uh, to interview you uh, and the fact that I'm a big Jeff Goldblum fan. So. Uh, <laughs> and Wes Anderson fan. So I think that that's how we ended up being paired up. But um, let's go back to unpack some of what you were just talking about. So first of all, incredibly interesting that you were working uh, with the Smithsonian and trying to figure out how to convey a lot of valuable information in a way that's easy to consume and easy to be entertained. And it seems like in the hospitality space now, um, there is even more information uh, that might we might be looking for uh, during a stay. So when you think about hospitality and you think about kind of the future of a digital layer, to use your terminology, what do you think that might look like in the future going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is... Um... I think what it, what we do in museums is very applicable, honestly, to hospitality, which is I was very excited to speak at the conference. And I'll also be speaking about NFTs, which is another thing I can certainly go down the rabbit hole about. Um, but, you know, I, I think what's what's interesting about going to a museum or going to any to visiting a city or any sort of location based experience is that there's a lot of there's there's a lot of like there's a lot of content there. There's a lot of reason to go there. There's a lot of context. There's a lot that that a visitor, if they're not prepared, um, is going to miss. Um, so, you know, I grew up in Philadelphia, I spent the last 15 years in Philadelphia, and a lot of people go there because, you know, the city has this whole historical texture. I mean, there's so much stuff that happened there, um, but it's pretty much invisible to most visitors. And then there's also a living culture. So there's amazing restaurants, amazing venues to, to hear music. Um, there's amazing, there's things that are constantly happening in the city. Um, and, you know, if you tap into the right places and then it, and on the internet, you can find that stuff. Um, 
But I think also, you know, places like hospitality and the concierge services that that some of these uh, organizations offer, like I think that can be up to, up the level and also made really personal. Um, so, you know, like, you know, I've got three little kids. So if like I'm traveling with them uh, to a city, I have a completely different use case than if I'm traveling for business. Um, and, you know, just like using technology to sort of adapt to the needs of your visitor, um, you know, like, and then often, you know, it's like also making sure that you're speaking their same language. So one of the things that, you know, we've done for museums is making sure that if uh, there's a Korean walking through the through the space, that they can see the the labels in Korean, that they get the they get interpretation um, that's that's relevant to them. So, you know, again, some of these same sort of lessons I think move move over to the hospitality space quite nicely. And do you think that as you know, you were instrumental in developing these experiences in these museums, and and, and frankly, that same consumer, that same guest, is going from one experience at a museum where there's an automatic translate to signage in their native language. Do you think sure. that they're going to be coming with these expectations soon to the hospitality industry as well? Oh yeah. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> I, I think, um, you better be I, ready. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that, I mean, honestly, I don't think museums are going to be the ones like, honestly, like setting the bar for the world. I, I think it's going to happen elsewhere. Um, but, I, I think that particularly as you see sort of the rise of AR um, and, and also as like technology gets a little bit sort of more disseminated out into the world as it sort of like moves off the screen and into the world, which is a lot of what these sort of like XR conversations are about and the metaverse conversations are about. Um, the metaverse was actually much more about AR before uh, Mark Zuckerberg sort of hijacked that conversation. Um, but I think the expectation is that is that yeah that that the information that you want about your world will be available to you, um, and that also that places like um, you know hotels, other 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 places that are, that that you might be visiting are going to be able to be lenses into that information and be curating that information in, in unique ways. So let's let's take that idea, but let's stand on the other side of the sure. registration desk for a second. Um, so. It, I think that there's also an opportunity to provide access to that information that you just described to the team members 100%. to su supplement the superpower of the service provider with a, as a resource to the guest. So when someone approaches them with with a question um, that that they're that empowered and uh, and educated to be able to respond to that, have you guys done anything in in your professional career that is power the team member oh yeah, yeah. no 100 percent um you know and and i would say you know one of the things that we you know it's funny like if you look at like the blue cadet portfolio there's like a lot of like touch screens and like big interactive glowing surfaces um which generally i hate um like I, like a like a like a giant glowing screen is like just not not my thing yeah. um you know i really like the technology to be transparent um and you know i want it, i want information to be available but i don't want to be you know in in the way um and or, or distracting of the actual experience and you know a lot of times when i'm talking to our clients you know we're referencing things like more like what's happening in like immersive theater you know i, I reference mm -hmm. like sleep no more um you know or then she fell or um some of these you know things like um the, the Westwood activation uh, at, at, um, at South by Southwest years ago. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of technology in those experiences, these like, but but it was the technology was to a person and the person interfaced um, with the guest. And I, and I think that's actually something that's, you know, we, we've been really pushing on the museums and they're, they're, they're trying to adopt that, which is to say like, look, you know, humans are an amazing piece of technology. They can do a lot of things uh, that a smartphone can't. Um, and they can and they can also express a lot of emotions and and do different things uh, in a way that like certainly none of these devices can. So it's like leverage that, you know, leverage the affordances of that and then supplement them with what technology can do. So, Josh, you just referred to Sleep No More, which is that interactive I experience in New York City at the McKittridge mm -hmm. Hotel. And um, maybe you could take like a, a minute and explain because I know you've had the benefit of experiencing it explain a little bit to the audience here what it was in case they're not familiar with it and oh, why sure. why you think it was an interesting kind of leading indicator of kind of you know geocentric kind of experiential theater essentially right oh yeah yeah 100 
Um, so Sleep No More, it's in it's in Chelsea, uh, in New York City. It's a Oh my gosh, probably about thirty thousand square foot space. I would imagine. You know, it's 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 built out over five floors, and they do this um, sort of deconstructed telling of Macbeth um, with with live action with uh, with with actors, and they're moving through the space. And you basically um, you go into a bar, and then you go through an elevator, and you wear these Harlequin masks, like very. Um, uh, what's uh, eyes wide shut kind of vibes. Um, and then you're sort of, then you, then you're allowed to sort of free roam through the space. And the thing that's interesting is like, you're not really free roaming through the space because they're using all these technology cues. They're using lighting, they're using sound, they're using actors. Um, there's all this sort of ways that they direct people to different experiences, shut down different experiences, change the intensity of lighting, um, change scenery. Um, in very subtle ways that, that move people very predictably through the space and actually controls a lot of the flow. Um, so like where it feels completely free form and like, and like, you're like, oh my gosh, you're just like, I get free reign. Like people actually tend to have a very predictable pattern through it. Um, and the same lessons also you can see in themed entertainment. So, um, you know, Disney World is one of the most manipulative places in the world um, in, in a way that's like very effective. Um, yeah, so they use a lot of- Exit through the gift shop. I think that is one of my favorite simple forms of manipulation. Um, totally, but they they also use a ton. There's a ton. Of, if you ever look at it from a, just like a like how do they move people through physical space and how do they direct them around physical space and like how do they get people to queue up for their parades like just using sound? Um, it's a it's a it's a it's a masterclass in like in basic you know basically experience design. So, so let's talk about um, because this audience is audience is a made up of people in the hospitality space as owners, operators, consultants, uh, and more. Um, so here you are, successful entrepreneur, thinker, innovator, experienced designer. Uh, I hope I'm not overselling you there. Um, at, who's who's already looked at other spaces and said, well, why isn't hospitality following suit. And it seems to me that the indies really have the greatest opportunity because of the, they're not constrained, right, to create these small experiences that they could test and try on their guests. And, and I'm wondering if you have any advice for the hoteliers out there about what they might do to create a, a layer of experience in their hotels that that maybe could be accessible to them through apps or through something else. Any ideas? Yeah, yeah. I mean, also, like, I have to say, it's, it's interesting, you know, having worked in museums for 20 years, like, I, I would say, like, in some ways, it doesn't matter who owns the collection, like, it, it's it's who owns the conversation. And, like, anybody mm -hmm. can, like, tell stories and tell these stories. So, like, you know, we're doing a, um, a museum for Walt Whitman um, in Camden, New Jersey, which was where, where, his, where he lived for most of his life. And, you know, it's like, you know, we'll have all these artifacts and stuff like that. And, you know, people will go to it. But I was like, you know, as I was talking to them, I was like, oh my God, this would make, this would make such a better boutique hotel. Like I would love to like, I would like, I would love to go to like the Walt Whitman hotel that just has, you know, that has all the, the sounds, the books, the ephemera, all of those things. Like that would be a really like enriching experience. And like, and having like, oh, and looking, yeah, I have a project for, all, for you. I have a project. Oh, we can do it. Sign we me can, up. I'll do it. I'll do it. I've got all, we've got all the content strategy already done. And like that, and that was actually one of the things that was really interesting is because like you know, Blue Cadet goes deep diving into the audiences, the personas, what what do the audience want? Like what kind of experiences do they want? And I was like, this sounds more like a boutique hotel experience than it does a museum stay. Like they want to sit, they their dwell time is not a one hour, two hour dwell time. Wow. They want to sit and live with this stuff. And I'm like, I was like, oh my God. Like I was like. I, I think so many things that are museums should be should be like Airbnbs. Like, like I, I would love to do an Iggy and the Stooges Airbnb in Detroit. Like, I think that makes more sense than a than a than a Stooges museum. Um, you know, and like I, I think that there's a, I just think you know again like I think you know a lot of these particularly these independent hotels have like you know an opportunity to to create really beautiful bespoke experiences that speak to the to the locations that they live in you know and and, and to give people reasons to to, to visit you know that are that and and not generic experience well that's i think you've just gone to a, a really important place so i just want to underscore it which is in the world that we're living in right now 
here we are having a conversation utilizing video conferencing tools, more sophisticated ones, but the basic idea applies. If you don't have a reason to travel, some people mm -hmm. might opt out. And I think we have an opportunity, you do, we're experienced designers ourselves, we have an opportunity to help our owner operator developers create more compelling experiences that then have the payoff. They have to have the payoff, right? Yeah, 100%. Uh, and, and so we, we do have this unique opportunity to help create those unique experiences that you can only have in one location. And maybe it's ephemeral, it's there and it's gone. Um, and so and I'm, I'm going to come back to an earlier question. I know you didn't intend to, to dodge it, but if you do want to dodge it, I give you the out. Um, you and I were chatting about um, Night Sky as a really cool app. And I, I was recently in, I was in Southern California, I was in Yosemite and the night sky was unbelievable. This, you could see all these stars and I pulled out my phone and I used that to understand what I was looking at. And just that idea that an app might be available for free to help me better understand what I'm looking at or where I am just seems incredibly powerful. Are there other tools out there that hoteliers might be able to tap into or restaurant tours that could help create another layer of information uh, for their um, guests? I mean, so I, I'll say that um, AR is like, is the future, um, but also AR is not on the phone. It's not like it's so before before Meta sort of took over this whole conversation about the metaverse, like where everything was heading was 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 AR. Um, so App, Apple's going to put out their uh, their product. Uh, Magic Leap is putting out a very advanced product. Um, Google is going to relaunch their glass. Like, you know, ultimately, this idea of, um, you know, this combination of machine learning, um, which is like you, your the, the technology can understand your environment. Like sure. it can look out there and say, like, oh, that's a spruce tree. Um, that's a Honda Accord. Like that's what a that's really what intelligent recognition can do with machine learning, and it can do it in the cloud and can do it in real like very very quickly. And then like once you have these devices that can that can basically then give you that information, um, it's just going to be very very powerful. So like that idea of like the the affordance that you get of the night sky to be like okay, I know what all those stars are, and I can see the constellations that will enter into our daily lives. And like twenty years from now, it will be shocking 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 um to our you know children uh or children's children that you know that that they like they can't i that you can't just identify what that is like you can't like that like like that the web exists your, contact like, lens, your contact lens that uh wasn't able to pick up what you're looking at right oh, i don't know about those i think those things are going to melt a lot of eyeballs <laughs> but, <laughs> but but the thing is like but also that but i would say too it's like look that there's the future and there's where we are and then there's like all these sort of intermediate steps along the way. And I think there's very, very practical things that can be done now um, that can really serve the visitor that are not just like, um, you know, stopgap hacks and technology prototypes um, where, where you can start delivering better visitor experiences to, to give to give visitors just like a better connection to the places that they're visiting and a better, better visitor experience overall. overall. Okay, I'm going to come back to it again. Any apps you're recommending in that? Oh, room? um the actual apps like they're really i mean so what i would say is take a look at everything that's being that's coming out of eighth wall um so eighth wall was recently purchased by niantic which is the makers of pokemon go um and they're starting to roll in a lot of really really interesting technology we're doing a big project with the metropolitan museum of art um using eighth wall uh for this it's called uh, uh chroma uh, met chroma uh that'll be coming out in july but the but what's also really interesting is the stuff that you get with Pokemon Go, which is like that very specific geolocation, and also the the understanding of your environment to right size things is now all in Web AR. So you're not going to need native apps for that. So right. Um, right. there's tremendous things coming out of it coming from that company. Can you talk a little bit about the Chroma project that you're working on with uh, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I can. Yeah, they put out they put out a press release. Um, so it's basically, um, you know, it, what it, one of the great misconceptions is that all of these, you know, very like ancient sculptures and plinths and all that were all, you know, basically white. Um, you know, the, and you know, there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of cultural baggage in that assumption uh, as well. But but you know, they they were always they were painted. The paint just wore off. Um, and you know, there's and 
when you start actually adding color back to these ancient plinths and, and these busts and you can see like, okay, well, see some of the skin tones, um, see how the, you know, see that the ancient world was a little bit more vibrantly uh, colored um, than what we see, like it gives you a different lens, a lens on them. And it actually makes them a lot more human. So what we're doing is an AR app where you can actually one place these plinths in your, in your home and ex explore them. But also when you go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and you can see these plinths, you can actually take your, take the app and see them in color. You can see the color uh, placed on top of them. So it adds a real utility uh, to, to, that, to that experience. That's a, really, that's a really cool idea. And I appreciate you being, being willing to share it because I think that sometimes people hear words like machine learning or AI or AR or XR, and there's a lot of confusion um, because yeah. a lot of it, it leads to, well, how does it apply to me? And is it about to be replaced with the next technology or platform yeah. or whatever it is. So uh, any guidance you want to offer up as it relates to adoption of technology overall? Yeah. There's my wife. This is life. Oh. Um. <laughs> yeah, she's on the show. Uh, we have um, there she goes. Uh, so uh, no, I would say um, you know what we always do is don't start with the technology and move backwards. You know, start with the story or the user or visitor experience and move forward. So you know, if you're if you have an independent hotel that happens to you know reside in a in what was a traditionally like amazing music district, you know, and you're like, okay, well, I just really want people to understand the musical heritage of this place, you know, or give them a feeling of like, what of the cultural gravitas of this neighborhood. Yeah. Start from there, start from there, you know, and like start from the content, start from the experience, and then we'll use the technology to get there. Um, and like, honestly, like I believe paper is a technology, um, you know, like I believe people are technology, you know, like, so the, que the question is like, you'll find the right tactics to tell that story. And the nice thing is, like, if you if you start from that core, it, it the new the two, the new technologies you can always swap it out. You know, you can always like change the layer um, because, like, if the core story makes sense, then then everything else is like pretty fungible. Okay, let's go to uh, what's on your nightstand. Um, any interesting books that could help some of the listener uh, audience better understand the world around them and. Uh, I, I'll, I can stall for you because I've got one on my nightstand uh, that I'm about halfway through that I think is pretty compelling, which is Kevin Kelly's book called The Inevitable that breaks down kind of the 10 forces that are changing the future. And he's talking a lot about what you're talking about, uh, which is what, how will technology aid the way that we live, the way that we connect, the way that we communicate going forward. And he, he speaks in a very understandable language. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a Kevin Kelly fan. And for anyone who doesn't have the attention span to read a book, Kevin Kelly's uh, a frequent TED talker, and you can find his talks, uh, or you can read his article about the mirror world uh, that he took over about two and a half years ago, he took over Wired Magazine and talked a lot, a lot about um, the digital twin and the mirror world, which I, I know you have stuff to say on that subject as well, especially with all your NFT stuff. But uh, oh, any book sure. recommendations for uh, for the uh, people listening? Sure, sure. I mean, I've I've honestly just been reading a lot of like Ryan Holiday's books on the Stoics, um, which are great. You should read them. Um, you know, if if you run a stressful business, I run too. Uh, it's very helpful. Um, on the technology side, I would say Homo Deus uh, by Yuval Harari is fantastic. It's a great lens into the future. Um, mm -hmm. it, it'll show uh, the good and the bad of what uh, what um, artificial intelligence uh, is probably mm -hmm. going to bring. Um, and then Jerome Lanier, um, who's actually the person that coined the term uh, virtual reality, mm -hmm. um, he's absolutely brilliant. Um, anything that he's written, uh, Who Owns the Future, um, is, a, is a fantastic one. I think he's another one It's like Ted Reasons to delete your social media account right now. Um, he, but everything that he's written and his his insights into VR and AR and the future of the metaverse and all that stuff are very, very compelling. Um, yeah. I, I, uh, I was going to recommend Joel Jarrow's book and I forgot the name of it. Um, and he tracked three different um, futures. Uh, he has Ray Kurzweil's uh, view of the future. He has uh, Bill Joy, who started Sun Microsystems, and he has one in between, 
Um, I forgot the name of the book right now. Um, yeah. But but again, I think the it, it, I want to remind so, Je Jennifer Egan's new book's really good too. Glad uh, Candy House. I read a lot of novels. I was an English major. <laughs> and look at you now. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell that to my daughter who's getting her English PhD right now. You never know where you're gonna. So, Josh, can you talk a little bit about uh, NFTs? I guess that's another one of those categories that people don't really understand blockchain or NFTs and kind of where we are in the life cycle. By the way, I had, before you answer that question, I wanted to go back to um, Metaverse and um, and Meta and Zuckerberg and everything. You know, there's yeah. a TED Talk by Chris Milk um, that oh, sure. is from three years ago, and he talks about where we are in the evolution of VR. It's a beautiful presentation. It really helps, uh, I think, the viewer understand that we're at the very early stages of these technologies and, um, you know, be patient and be experimental and forgive the clunkiness of, you know, a blinding uh, Oculus uh, headset. Um, right. But he, he would, he, he, his company did get just purchased by Meta. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, supernatural was purchased by Meta. So that worked out. Um, that worked out. Okay. But it's, a great, but it's a great. It's a great application. It's a very pragmatic application. Um, you know, I would say. I mean, I don't. We might not have a lot of time left, so I'll, I'll talk quickly on. Um, oh, you have a few minutes. Just if oh, you don't. Know, okay. Well, then, uh, let me say. So, so here's the thing. You know, NFTs. Um, so one also like I'm also doing an NFT. Uh, uh, project a company called art world uh where we'll be launching our first project at christie's in june in july cool. actually um and then if anybody's in la uh on june 11th uh, i'm hosting a symposium at the hammer museum um and then we're also doing some stuff at, at uh, nft nyc at the same time as uh, this conference um so there's some fun things there um so the thing that i would say about nfts are like it reminds me a lot of like the early days of e-commerce where like the basic idea is like profound and amazing. And some of the idea, the executions and like the, the early kind of prototypes were like stupid. Um, so it's like pets.com, like they would literally like mail you a 50 pound bag of dog food with no oh, shipping. and handling. Uh, Can you believe that? <laughs> I, had a, I had an ex-girlfriend um, who used to work for Cosmo.com and she was paid by the hour um, to be a bike courier. Um, she would bike a pint of Ben and Jerry's to someone's house for no shipping and handling at the cost that it would cost them to like go down the corner store. Um, and like, she would also just like hang out with them for hours and still get paid. Like not, but like, but like e-commerce, like bad business model, right, but e-commerce right. survived. So anyway, like NFTs, the idea of digital ownership, like, uh, like is, is profound. It's really, really profound um, because like at the end of the day, like, you know, like this photograph here was mm -hmm. like, is a digital file that like, I just happened to get printed out, you know? And the only reason that I printed out and put it in my home is because I can say that I own it, um, you know, because it has a signature on the back, but also cause like I did the website for the artist and or for the photographer and gave it to me. So it has, it had, I can claim it. Um, so this idea of an NFT is just, is just the thing that allows you to say, I can claim this, that I, that this thing has value, that it has ownership. And I think what you're, it's going to open up an entire massive category of a digital product that, that will be ownable and tradable. And, um, it's going to be huge. And, and honestly, you know, it's not going to necessarily be like $400,000 for a JPEG. Like that's not really, that's not going to be forever. It's going to be people going and having experiences at hotels and stuff like that and like and collecting things and collecting experiences in a way that sort of like where the blockchain actually records records their life in a way that's very ownable um that their identity their identity is very uh very ownable and centralized around their personal identity and not owned by organizations like meta um you know or, or monetized you know through you know instagram um so yeah. it's it, it's profound so I'm giving you two thumbs up and I'm, I'm just to support your idea. I thought of the name of the book, which is Radical Evolution by Joel Jarrow. And I'm going to oh, take, I'm going to take, uh, yeah, look up Radical Evolution. It's an amazing book, but I'm going to take the optimist, the Ray Kurzweil view on NFTs that you were just talking about, which is, I think that NFTs and blockchain could allow artists to feel like they're willing to put their creativity out into the world because they will have more ownership of the of the actual original license for the product as opposed to some of the platforms 
that are in place now that are intermediaries for creatives like Spotify, for example, that is taking such a significant portion of the revenue associated with the distribution. So um, I, I'm just asking if you would support my optimistic view of where NFTs might go. Oh, yes. Huge as collective, um, huge as in, uh, oh, hey, Josh. Um, I would say ubiquitous. I mean, I think, I think, I think this, I, it, the thing is also like NFTs, like it's such a terrible term. It's like, it reminds me of like MP3s, you know, like what, back in the day, it was like, oh, I downloaded a bunch of MP3s. And it's now it's just like, I just have all the music that I want. Right. right you know, right. it's like, I don't care File about this. It doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's like, you know, it's like, I don't, I don't sit there and say like, oh yeah, like I was scrolling through Instagram through a bunch of JPEGs or P PNGs. It's like, it's just like, those are images. Those are memories. That's art. Um, you know, it's music. Like the 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 terminology and the blockchain and all that stuff it's just like you know it's like who cares you know like at some point all that stuff disappears and it's just like the stuff that you care about mm -hmm. and like and um i think yeah i think i think i think nfts will be ubiquitous and i think yeah. creating nfts will be and uploading an nft will be no more significant than uploading a jpeg or taking a photo like you know you think about like you know in the they when i was growing up like the how many photographs were taken versus how many photographs are taken now. It's like it's exponential, you know. And I think photos, the same. The same how many photos do you have? How many photos do you have on your phone right now, Jeff? Oh, I never erased them, and I also have three small children. So, uh, oh gosh. So I'm oh, like, oh, I have I'm, I have eight thousand four hundred twenty-one. Okay, I'm twenty. I'm twenty-three thousand photos on my phone. I'm just one person. I mean, yeah. The, well, and, the also, like, and also like when you talk about like barriers to entry and stuff like that, like, like there's all these pictures of my daughter just doing selfies of herself, you know? So, but like, but at some point, like uploading, like creating an NFT or, or, you know, like, like it will be, or creating something um, that, that is a, 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 a di an ownable digital object, um, I think will be no more significant than, you know, taking a photo. So let's, let's bring this to closure. Um, you are going to be uh, in Brooklyn for the ILC event in uh, in Brooklyn on the June twentieth and twenty first. Please join us, everybody. Uh, any preview you want to give? Thank you so much, Indie Cultivate. There you go, June twenty twenty one, Brooklyn, New York. Um, any uh, any teaser you want to put out to lure this audience and others to to what you have to say? So um, so I'm going to be on the stage with Kevin McCoy, who actually I've, I've been on panels with before, who's fantastic. He's the inventor of the first NFT. Um, he really, really understands the technical architecture of NFTs. He can answer all this stuff. He's a profound thinker. Um, so we'll be talking more about that. Um, but I, I think that like there, there is actually a pragmatic use case for for NFTs. Like that is not just like a weird hype, um, you know, uh, you know, cash grab in this in this moment. I, I think I think there's like some really interesting things that can be done and some interesting explorations. Um, but like again, you know, like I my my principal interest is in just creating more interesting spaces and spaces that people want to visit, the spaces that people love, like locations people love. Um, so I'm just like super eager to like tease that out and have some great conversations. That's awesome. Well, I'm sure it's going to happen. Uh, we managed to fill over 30 minutes and I'm sure we could fill another 30. So I will look forward to seeing you live and in person in Brooklyn in a month. And I hope that we can be joined by some of the people who are with us. Thanks so much for spending time. All right. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Great to see you, Josh. Thanks everybody.